So welcome back. Thank you for joining Hare today. Krishna. So we'll continue our discussion on the ugly rainbow of consumerism. Yes. And uh, we have four shades remaining, and we'll take them one by one about how in this. Uh, maybe we can go back and just quickly re recap what we discussed. Okay. For okay. some. So basically. the whole point and we started with is that uh, there are people who have a constant anxiety because they are defined by their work and because there is or the truthless competition they they are defined by their work and yeah the idea is if i am defined by my work my success depends on me alone and then if my success doesn't come then it my existence is ending so yeah uh, self definition through work the idea of meritocracy without considering any uh, role for fate and then constant anxiety so yeah. when we are having these discussions uh, the question so are we of going to offer a alternative to consumerism at a at a global level or is it more like we are encouraging our readers to our viewers to recognize that these are all the consequences that come up and therefore they can withdraw themselves at an individual level as much as possible from the consumerist mania i very good point now this was something told by told to me by a very nice preacher uh saying that there are some situations in our age where we can uh, have a global kind of a impact and some situations where we can have only a micro impact and he gave a very simple example that if it is raining in mumbai and you have to protect yourself your health is also not good but at the same time you have to go for a program so what you do is you wear a nice rain coat you wear rain shoes gum boots you have a nice cap and plus an umbrella and then also you take some painkiller paracetamol or put some mustard oil so by praying you cannot stop the impact of rain falling on the entire city that is beyond you at the same time you cannot afford to just sit in a corner and whine saying that why this is happening to me now that i am trying to do something glorious and look at how uh, material nature is just trying to stop me at a micro level you stop that influence from hampering you harming you so that at least your activity goes on um, unhindered and at okay. least it's like a small victory so so when we use, when we are tackling this philosophical points there could be a universal victory for for example in my mindset correct me if i'm wrong that when prabhupad wanted that from the legal point of view the high court should say that the hari krishna religion is not just an nra not just a new religious movement emphasis on the word new saying that doesn't have any roots doesn't have any philosophy and it's just a cult so that one new york circuit court saying that hari krishna movement is bona fide so that's like a macro effect all over the world it is felt people can use that certificate that court order to say that this is what we are doing so that is the macro kind of thing and when we are discussing things like meritocracy and how work defines you so these are some tools techniques or mindsets which an individual can use so that just because he has to be in the rat race he may also win sometimes he may lose sometimes but as i say even if you win the rat race you remain a rat yeah so how to so how to prevent yourself from being a rat are you are you getting what mm. which i'm trying to say that okay, right. at, at, at at the individual level or at a family level you prevent your family from being kind of sucked in it's like a like a aircraft engine what does a bird have a chance of surviving the bird can fly the aircraft can fly but with the power of the jet engine 
it can suck in a bird. So that's how an individual can get sucked in today's vortex. Of, and how uh, that individual can protect oneself. Protect oneself, yeah. Good point, yeah. So then if we go back to the three point, we didn't mention it. So if the consumeristic culture makes us define ourselves with our work or equate ourselves with our work, then we understand that actually I'm a spiritual being. So my work is a part of who I am, but that is not who I am primarily. And then exactly. if we consider meritocracy, we understand that our endeavors matter, but there are things beyond our endeavors also which matter. That's why we don't, so that is where we might get a philosophical understanding of previous life and karma and destiny, which can help us over there. And then with respect to anxiety, again, if, uh, if we are too at, if we define our, define worldly things only as the sources of all pleasure or even of our very basis of existence, then not having them will cause us great anxiety, but otherwise we can relatively manage the anxiety. That right? For example, there's just a small thing in Japan. Uh, we were learning in our management days, management school days, that in the 50s, when Japan was just reeling from the aftermath of its heavy defeat in the Second World War, the country as a whole kind of resolved that militarily we were defeated, but industrially we will win. So, so it was a pride for people to say that. Like somebody says, I'm an engineer, I'm in IT, I'm in IT, I'm in computer science, I'm a PhD in this. So there was this atmosphere where people would be with pride, they would say, I am with Hitachi, I am with Toshiba, I am with Sony. So the company gave them that kind of a the corporation gave them the family feeling that you are part of this family and then you are very valued and you are very valid. Unfortunately, it was hollow. It could not sustain itself. So 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, somehow four decades, it continued. And then came, again, it's a Japanese word, karoshi, which means death at the workplace because of yes. stress. I've so, heard it's a big phenomenon. I think Japan has the highest work related suicides in the world. Yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, so therefore, here is someone there is a there is a lot of pride in what you do and there's a corporation and, and some some companies went to the extent of having everybody having the same uniform everybody comes in the morning and there is a company song and they do some calisthenics some aerobics or whatever so they put in the mood and ultimately what for it is just like Srila Prabhupada went to Dine Pond Press and there was some discussion and one person came and he was a secretary to the boss and in japan everybody who comes the protocol is to present your greeting to your business card so Prabhupada met the marketing operations and the workshop manager the sales manager the boss so there were six seven cards and when this secretary came he also presented his card and since uh, he was the one, the main link with the company and Prabhupada was bargaining on BTG prices and network of devotion. So he became a bit friendly and finally Prabhupada popped the question, so what's the goal of your life? So he just took all those cards on the table, put them in a stack, then took out one more from his pocket and put it on the top. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a dramatic way of demonstrating one's life goal. Exactly. Yeah. So what did Prabhupada say to him? I think Prabhupada also replied quite that's temporary or something Prabhupada said. Yeah, he said what's the use of being a temporary head of mm. some temporary unit but then if today's work culture consuming culture if it gives you a recess like, a, like in, a, in a game even in a football game there is a lunch break or cricket also there is a lunch break there is no break in today's atmosphere where you can step, uh, take one step back, imbibe some philosophical wisdom, and take a look at life. As, is, is, it, is, is this going in the right direction? So this is what we are we are discussing. That it's constant competition. We talked about keeping up with the Joneses. That my work defines me. They say that you have to move twice as fast to remain in the same place. Yeah. 
I think this I have seen especially in uh, my friends who work in the field of software. They earn a lot, but then they have to learn a lot also because yeah. things they keep changing, the skills keep changing, and uh, it's very competitive. When we talk about consumerism, just you mentioned Japan. Uh, is it that some countries are afflicted with this problem more because if you consider the first world country, Singapore is also a first world country. Australia is also a first world country. Mm, of course, America is considered the leader of the first world country. Uh, are we having mental health problems uh, in all the first world countries in general? Or is it that in some countries it is more than others? One modicum to find out is to see which are the highest paid professionals. And if you find among the top five are mental health care professionals, then you have your answer. Mm, that's a good way of looking at it. That no, is the top, yeah. Uh, no, among, among the top paid are the top uh, are the psychiatrists, and among the highest rates of suicides among professionals, you'll also find a psychiatrist coming in the first five. Yeah, that's tragic. They just, it's very it's very painful. Another way I thought of it, this is that we will probably come to this point later, but uh, how obsessed are people with entertainment? Because entertainment also is an escape way. And the and more... That will come when we cover media. And yeah, yeah, we'll come to that. Yeah. So basically, let's start with uh, love now. So there are many yeah, okay. su subtler effects of uh, uh, the fourth one. You'll start off and then yeah. move. Yeah. You want to start? Yeah. I'll just introduce it. So, so within this whole, as we call it the rainbow, where is the question for love? Love, one of the most basic emotions uh, in human society. And uh, of course, love, as they say, is the basis of almost all novels. Love is the theme of almost every rock and roll song. Um, people say, is this love? Or was it love? Or is this real love? When do I find real love? But when we see love being made into a commodity, that unless you buy something, I'm just taking one aspect of it, maybe we can expand later if you have other points also. That unless you buy something for someone, you don't show love. So the whole thing is based on the extraneous feature of spending money and buying something which the industrial economy is producing. Hmm. Otherwise, there is no way you can show love. That's, a, that's an important point. Because even from a, we could say, a sattvic psychological perspective, different people have different love languages. Yes. And giving and receiving gifts is just one of them. You know, spending quality time could be another one. Or just, uh, there could be various other aspects which get devalued. And uh, the, so, with love being extrinsic, there can be two aspects to it. The way I express love for others is by certain external things, like the objects I buy for them. Or I also feel that I will be able to attract love from others when I have something extrinsic with me. And this actually corrodes all relationships. Now, when we usually talk about love, it's associated with a romantic relationship. Uh, but even in it, we can come to a romantic later, but even in a, a parent-child relationship, often children feel that uh, it is, if I perform well in my academics, then I will get my parents' love. Otherwise, my parents won't love me. So in that sense, right from their childhood, they start believing that 
they don't have an they don't have any intrinsic intrinsic uh, right to be loud rather they have to acquire something extrinsic by which they will earn they will become love worthy mm. and that can cause a lot of insecurity and in some ways this performance or love related with performance it is often in the urbanized developing countries say for example i have i've seen about in india and even in china i saw a parenting book called tiger mom which <laughs> is <laughs> basically about chinese mother but generally about parenting how mothers have enormous expectations from their children and unless those expectations are fulfilled the children just they find that their mothers are overbearing so in some ways maybe in the western world the parents don't have that many expectations from their children but then it's almost like a hands off attitude now maybe i don't know how to parent i don't know how to deal with children so then you do what you want with your life and that is also another way of feeling un- of not getting love so one would be that in love i have too many expectations from you and other is in love i have no expectation from you at all it just your life do whatever you want both could lead to a both could lead to a psychological harm for the child any thoughts on this yeah uh, as you mentioned tiger mom the concept of uh, a mothers day or a fathers day earth day and then so many the day women's day so the industrial culture doesn't allow for many holidays mm. uh, i think we discussed it that at the beginning of the industrial revolution some guy a big shot sat together and saw that there are 37 or 38 holidays in the english calendar and he thought just told that uh, in order to make these people work i'll just bring it down to a minimal four that's it only four public holidays allowed otherwise we cannot have this kind of production uh, running on so if it is mothers day that means there are special mothers day coupon there are special mothers day gifts give this to your mother and show that you really love her you just see the language this is a dress which you can buy and amazon prime will ship it within 24 hours guaranteed to reach her just a day before mothers day or on the day of day mothers day and this will show that you really love her now there was a point when the sons would or the daughters would buy that but it's really dangerous when both moms and children they both buy the same line and that gives rise to this huge culture in india we have another way of uh like someone told me this is another hypocritical way we say we don't need to show our love like that because we love our moms for 65 days of the year we never told them that they never expected but then we see widows lying languishing in like say vrindavan there are so many mothers who have been left there are stories of uh, young couples they cannot take care of their elderly and they just leave them in some some railway station they just take them on a journey and they just put them now i'm not saying i'm not making a big generalization of one or two events but the idea is there that whether we follow the west where we love your mom only for a day or be smug and secure thing that i am part of any culture we don't show like that the point we have to address is has the exhibition of love does it have to be so extrinsic so extra extraneous so external hmm in some ways this could also be related with culture that you know what we might call as the public display of affection and what say in maybe a little more traditional cultures that might be disapproved but that might be just a normal way of expressing affection 
let's say that the way in which expect, expect, affection is expressed uh, that may vary from culture to culture but the principle is that uh, whether the affection expressed is is authentically connecting the two people or is it there is a word i re read recently called pr charity so <laughs> so you do charity so that you can have a good image in society how good i am so in some ways is it you could say pr love i want to show the world that i have such a happy family i am such a happy relationship and uh, in that sense if the connection is not really with the two people at a deep level then whichever whatever you do for expressing that is immaterial i read this study there's a book called uh, the it's a what is that book god the evidence it is is talking about how uh, karl marx had the idea that religion is the opium of the masses uh, sigmund freud had the idea that this is like a like a projection of a needy child for, for imagining a father or something like that anthropic projection but he said whatever you can name you give what people have found is that those who have some not this religious uh, affil affiliation but who have some regular religious practice today's world we might want to use the word spiritual but basically they have some committed spiritual practice they have better relationships they have better mental health they recover faster from diseases on the other hand those who reject all kinds of spirituality and sink into sensuality there was in in american history and now it is coming to the world of india also there was what is called as the free sex revolution or they call it the sexual revolution so it basically started with sigmund freud in some ways he had the idea that uh, all of us have uh, have sex repressed sexual urges uh, it's quite a i would say perverted idea so he felt that every boy has a has a urge for his sexual urge for his mother every girl has a sexual urge for her father and because society disapproves it so it leads to various pathologies as the children as people grow up and his ideas were as they spread into the mainstream culture the idea was that if we just reject all restrictions and we just have free expression of sexuality then there will be no inhibition on love but the result has actually been that people are more lonely than ever before it is yeah because the it's the connection between people has to be much deeper than simply the physical contact and so it has actually people have become more objectified as as sometimes they say that you know a man treats a woman like a sex machine and a woman treats a man like a atm machine of course now i heard about it but now it's like gender roles are also changing so sometimes there are women who may treat man like a sex machine and a man who may treat a woman like a source of money but whichever way it is it is all so obsessed with externals because in one sense the idea of love itself was made very trivial so it's there is the body there is the mind and there is the soul so now once we start going to the external direction it's the looks of the body or the money that you have you have to enjoy the level of the body and this this is all very external to who we are and beyond that there is a mind and yes people may have their own repression they may have the psychological wounds but beyond it all there is the spiritual spark that the soul who is the essence of who we are and unless a relationship goes at a deeper level where one just looks beyond the uh, one sees beyond the looks and the uh, other such externals no relationship can endure 
and thus there is a constant insecurity about how a relationship will continue because people always feel like there is nothing maybe there's nothing within me that is lovable it's something around me which i have to acquire and i have to scrupulously maintain by which i'll be able to um i'll be able to, i'll be loved yeah so from a spiritual perspective do we first of all we look at ourselves spiritually and we try to connect with each other spiritually i often talk about say horizontal relationships and vertical relationships so if we have a vertical relationship with krishna study then that itself gives us some amount of security and then our to some extent our emotional needs are satisfied by our relationship with krishna and then if we have to turn toward other relationships and seek something over there that is not so disruptive or overwhelming because we don't become desperately needy for those relationships we can move toward the relationship with a with it some level of maturity or we can move into a relationship with the desperation and then when it's the second then it's almost like go from 1 to 2 to 3 illa it could be a big subject of relationships but when love is seen to be extrinsic then it it basically makes relationships unsustainable yeah there is a very nice thing uh, about this idea of uh, first of all understanding whom are we loving and uh, how do we begin so a traditional indian um, example that uh, okay i'll set the principle first as such i am having problem being loved and trying to find out who are the objects of my love today hardly now i'm not putting too fine a point on that but patriotism is not something which you kind of say oh i love my country i love my country of course when the country wins some sports thing whatever you say i love my country otherwise mostly it is i me and mine it's just me 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 so uh, the situation is i am having trouble loving so many objects and then when i come to the bhagavad gita it says start loving krishna so you say i am already having trouble with so many attempts and now you are telling me to love i fear that i may also fail here so the understanding given is just like a girl getting married in a family her primary relationship is with the groom that day like a traditional indian marriage people are also amazed at how in india the ceremony can go on for hours and hours and hours or sometimes for two three days yeah. just to confirm that now you are two uh, legally in love with each other so to say so the idea is you have a relationship only with this one person but that relationship that very day or that very hour like a nuclear fission it suddenly gives a rise to 30 40 relationships this is my husband sister this is the sister's husband this is the sister's kids this is the husband's second sister this is the husband's brother so the bhagavad gita says we start loving krishna only after that we can learn how to love everybody else because they are all part of krishna's energy or they are part of krishna so this attempt is not to be considered as one more attempt at trying to love to gain success in love in fact like proper rights and electro devotion this is that one main switch all other switches are on but still the fans don't work lights don't work the mics doesn't work mm-hmm. because the main switch is off so the main switch of loving krishna when it is on then you can start other things and then you'll find that once you put on the light fans mic system sound system everything will start working everything will fall in place then right yeah Mm. and then we are intrinsically parts of krishna we have an intrinsic capacity to love krishna so it's like a fertile soil the seed will automatically grow over there so in that sense loving krishna is not something extrinsic to us it is something it is the natural energy of the soul which is simply to be activated mm. so that is love then 
now we could take this to the next point related is that if love is primarily expressed through giving things and taking things and the idea is consumption is considered to be the central activity in society so if the consumer is the king and this creates the idea that oh i am the enjoyer but then i am also the slave who is providing for the enjoyment of others yeah i am also the and and i am also the producer who has to often without any relaxation i have to produce tirelessly so this idea of reducing a human being to a producing consuming unit and this is is it actually quite dehumanizing in fact pleasure is reduced to all kind of, or all happiness is reduced to consumption either of uh, other of physical sensations or now we could have say more of digital sensations also and with this idea people on one side they think that the more more products i have the more things i buy the the more successful i am but whether that success leads me to happiness that it's something to open to question and we have a phenomena which is more widespread than alcoholism although it's uh, effects are although it is its effects are not known to be that harmful but they still there it's significantly a problematic that shopaholism people just hook on to buying more and more and more and buy they buy not just because they need so many things but just uh, uh, the the word uses retail therapy retail shop therapy till you shop till you drop yeah shop till you drop retail therapy is that by buying you feel good about yourself mm-hmm. uh, there is a there is i saw a youtube channel which is called unbox therapy so you get a product and you unbox it and you feel good about it <laughs> so mm-hmm. this commodification of love also leads to the uh you could say almost the objectification of enjoyment enjoyment is in we con- or we consuming things and this in some ways deadens us to subtler joys of life the more we expect it's like the more we eat food which is heavily spiced then if you get a natural vegetable or natural fruit it appears so it tasteless or if you are habituated to hearing noisy music then maybe gentle classical music it just doesn't feel sufficiently exciting so often it the the, the consumerist ethos if i can use the word ethos for it the consumerist culture not only does it make the pleasures that we chase after superficial but those pleasures which are deeper we also become somewhat desensitized to them and that the, in the in that sense is a catch 22 we crave for something where it is not there and where it is there we become desensitized to getting that krishna says bhogaishvara prasaktanam taya apahrit chetasam devasayatmika buddhi samadhau na vidhiyate we just cannot have the steadiness to experience subtler joys if we are too caught in equating pleasure with gross sensations yeah, so so this this thing kind of began as uh, we were discussing what before we started that uh, the romans had uh, a huge empire then we had the british empire so i mean i have not seen perhaps it could be there but or it was not uh, written like that but they didn't have giant corporations telling people that all what we are doing is only for you and this is exactly what uh like the modern man homo sapiens sapiens means reasoning man one who thinks hmm. and i think it should be like there should be some latin name for shopping so it could be <laughs> the shopping man Oh, yeah. is only is only defined as somebody who comes and shops 
and I just talked of retail therapy. Excuse me. So, if there is a magazine and there is a reader, so 1950s, 60s, we saw a boom in. I'm just giving a tiny example. Who is the enjoyer, and what is the product? So the answer was very simple. The magazine is the enjoyer. Uh, the magazine is the product, and the person reading is the enjoyer. Mm -hmm. How subtly corporations turned the whole thing upside down. By 80s and 90s, it is the the magazine publisher who is the enjoyer. And the person reading is the product. For example, oh okay. Not many people notice that, but I used to see that uh, in college days that this politics and news weekly magazine is read by fifty-two percent of our readers are graduates. Twenty percent of our readers have a See the language. A disposable income of thirty thousand rupees or more per year. That means their basic wants are already taken care of. They have disposable okay. income, like disposable diapers or disposable okay. pan napkins or handkerchiefs or tissue papers or whatever. So, if they have so much of disposable income, they don't need to repaint their house. But in case they do. Whose which paint are they going to choose? So advertise in our magazine, and they may choose your paint. Advertise in our magazine, and if they want another car, they will buy your car. Advertise in this magazine, and they may buy furniture, which could be your furniture, or your product, your brand TV, or your food, or whatever. Hmm. So, so the product became the consumer, and the consumer became the product. But how do you convince people that? So then came this classic line that consumer is king, and we have like real kings, very few of them. Maybe in some Tahiti or some other places in Swaziland, we may have a real king. Otherwise, constitutional monarchy is mostly diluted. In some countries, they have a king, but he also is a paid a salary or something. So there are few kings who are like nominally they are kings, mm. but the idea of a king is so deeply entrenched that you just feel happy that somebody is saying I am the king. I choose if I don't choose this particular brand, the company kind of trembles. The company kind of uh, really is wary of. Well, if the consumer doesn't choose us, then We, who are we? We are nothing. I remember my father used to do magic tricks because uh, he had less money during his school college days. So one trick was all the fifty-two cards are same. <laughs> Just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay. And uh, uh, you know, like our Pyari Mohan Prabhu is like a magician, mm. and uh, he's called for birthday parties. So my father would say that I would do the same thing, simple family type of shows, and just something to just earn some money for buying his college textbooks or whatever. So this works extremely well with six to eight year olds. Like you tell them, pick any card, and then you do something, and then they they say, okay, can I guess which card is that? And they are simply amazed that this person is. Like, imagine he just did the. Uh, Something and he came to know what what card was, but the process is simple. Every card is the same. Hmm. So, while telling the consumer that you are the king, they are only making him or her buy exactly what they want. But the whole thing is given a kind of a coating that it just what so like car sales people they are trained. That after a family come, they show them. So, what would it be, the blue one or the silver one? I am giving you a choice. Yeah, what is that saying? You know, freedom is never taken away as effectively as by giving the illusion of freedom. 
exactly so you give people a large variety of choices and then people just don't realize that i also have the choice of not taking any of these but you just completely forget that so that's a very subtle way of uh, manipulation actually so and consumer, this has this, this consumer as king that's my last point this consumer as king has put such a weight on the now we can say that puny shoulders of our fragile ecosystem that uh, there are people coming out with the ideas that if we continue like this we will need two extra planets uninhabited nobody staying there but with similar natural resources so that we can get something from them and kind of use it here yeah i think when india got independence and it some it is a story it may be true it may be a somewhat apocryphal apocryphal that some british leader asked gandhi and they say that you know will india be following the british model of development he said he replied that you know for one small britain to develop it required it required resources from the whole earth if india is to follow that mad model will require several earths so <laughs> we don't have that so we'll have to we will follow our own model of development unfortunately whether we did that or not is open to question so now just one thought i had about this consumer is the king that this idea itself makes people feel that if i am the king then i have to have the status symbols of a king and while every society had its own trappings of success so for example a duke in the medieval british society or european society had to dress in a particular way or a king has to have a particular amount of uh, status associated with them but the idea that so many people will buy so many things that are simply what are called as lifestyle products or status symbols that itself becomes a huge pressure and uh, that's how people with the consumerist ethos they say if they, if you are made to believe that you are a king then you have to have the the products that prove that you are a king and otherwise it says that that you know, if your phone doesn't have if your phone doesn't phone doesn't have a new feature then it's like you have no future <laughs> you have no future it's it's almost like that so there is this uh, say a car there's a ad which is said that you are your car so it's not only your your body but you are your car your your status your position in society is defined by your car so we say that it is we have the concept in the bhagavad gita of ahankar so we could modify it and say ahamkar <laughs> <laughs> i am my car so it's this extrinsic identification grows to a large extent where by the consumer is the king idea we have to prove or prop up our status by having the latest status symbols available with us i think it was oscar wilde who said that fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we have to change it every 6 months yeah. <laughs> yeah so we have three more to go uh, we'll take one more and we'll do one more session afterwards or we'll try to rush through all three no 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 we can even no one don't sir okay so i thought related this we could could take the idea of the media yeah because consumerism and media are related then we have the idea of there is no spare time available um yeah then there is the last one isn't it we did meritocracy we did work to find oh yeah then we have two just two more yeah so three yesterday and we had four today so i think we are able to complete both also let's see yeah so if we consider the media uh a few years ago i read a book by neil postman it is called amusing ourselves to death 
and his idea was that how entertainment has devalued or degraded all aspects of life so he for he says not only it is like there are movies and stuff stuff like that was entertainment always but now politics has to be entertaining and then he says that now some some religious people are happy that our religious stuff in you know, our religion is on tv he said that okay if your religious discourses come on tv what happens is they have to be catered to the medium of the tv and then religion also becomes a part of the entertainment and as the most successful speakers or most popular speakers become those who are not necessarily the most spiritually minded people or the most uh, most erudite people but those those who are the best performers so the media has to some extent permeated all walks of life and in the past the if, if there's a politician who wanted to be elected say the us president or among the most important one of the most important assistants of the uh, politician would be the speech writer but now it is the media manager and often the media manager has to be a expert spin doctor and you take any event and spin it in such a way that the it gives a positive impression of the person so the media doesn't just report news it creates news whatever it reports becomes newsworthy and whatever is not reported gets lost okay so this is one of my favorite topics also so something from the archives of the bbc i don't know which year was that but once there was an announcement that this is the british broadcasting service and there are no news today there are no no news today <laughs> okay nothing worthwhile happened in the world that uh, is alarming or important or whatever it was just an ordinary day okay so we can imagine how they say trustworthy news so i consider this as ground zero that they really were sure that there is nothing which we should tell people that uh, you know should take up their time so after that with so many channels and after the second world war everything exploded so if you have 24 by 7 news then you have to have something to say mm. like if you are if you are maintaining a whole army of graphic artists and cameramen and presenters and everything so basically it kind of became a frankenstein where we create a artificial living being and then that particular being kind of tries to attack its own creator or tries to uh, destroy its own creator how is, how is it like a frankenstein in what like, sense it it was meant to enlighten us it was meant to inform hmm. it was meant to unify people but then it it is doing exactly the opposite of what it was meant for it is divisive it is causing more ignorance it is it is diverting people's attention away from important things so so uh, some of the other salient uh, developments in the media were like richard nixon he didn't trust tv so much because that time the american debates were presidential debates were mostly radio so it so happened that those who heard him on radio uh, debating with kennedy they thought that nixon had a very good argument and those who watched the debate on tv they saw the young john kennedy and they thought that kennedy had a better argument so i mean they say that radio is sound and tv is not radio plus pictures it's a whole different game mm. similarly the internet is not tv with some connectivity or with some other thing. it's a whole different game so it took some people like that kind of a time to understand and now we have like as you said religion has to entertain news has to entertain science has to entertain like even something like astronomy or astrophysics 
astrophysics for people who are in a hurry to understand. So like in seven minutes, somebody will try to make you understand what a black hole is, what this is, what that is. And if it is not entertaining, if it is not fun, people are not interested. Anyway, there is, there is some merit in making even a common person understand or even a uh, juvenile person understand some heavy subject matter. What we are trying to focus is the fear factor. So news, what news sells is always impending danger, impending catastrophe, impending something very bad is going to happen. And in that whole thing, any news which is uh, like uplifting or uh, I don't use the word cheerful, but something which gives you hope, it has no meaning. And so our, my original point here was that news is uh, news as terrifying. In the last four years, we have used the we've seen the word being thrown around fake news, fake news. Yeah. And this charge is being leveled against big, big media houses that just for the sake of improving their television rating points or their coverage or whatever, they just uh, say something or, or like they say, news doesn't happen at the place where it happened, but it happens in the studios of these big broadcasting corporations. Beautiful, yeah. It's it's so amazing how the news can be positioned. Something which is, and writing, I learned this that if you want to give the same news a positive tilt or a negative tilt, say X Y Z had problems, but he's stable now. X Y Z is stable now, but he had problems. So just change the say emphasis and everything can change and it's uh, the medium as you said the medium affects the message in so much a way that almost the message has to recast itself by which the message can by which the medium determines the message in many ways yeah. so provocation can be in both ways one is fear and the other is desire and both can fill people with with agitation and the media basically does both of them in some ways advertising involves creating fear and creating desire fear if you don't have this then what is your worth no one will ever look at you and you get this then people look at you so it's a uh, in the past uh, Ad advertisements were based primarily on explaining the merits of the product. But now it's not so much how good the product is, but how good the product will make you feel. And the product will make you feel good when without the product you are feeling bad. Yeah. So in that sense, create insecurity. So on one side, the news and the, and the commercials. So the news fill the mind with so much agitation that we need some relief from all that. And the way we get relief is by either buying stuff or then we buy entertainment. And the media in that sense, news and the entertainment. So basically if you consider news, what all is there or in the media, what all are there? There is news, there's entertainment. Entertainment can have movies and sports, which are two primary things. And then we have the commercials. So, all three work together almost like an excess where the news agitates us so much maybe the news doesn't agitate us with the desire but the news agitates us with uh, with fear and then we have the movies which often agitate us with desire and then we from the agitation you try to get so from the news in the agitation in the news we get some relief maybe by watching the movies and while watching the movies, we see people who are very smart, very good looking, very wealthy. And then that triggers the desire. And then there are the commercials which trigger those desires, buy this, buy this. So it's almost like a, earlier you were the example of a jet plane, which 
and a, a bird gets sucked in uh, the, yeah. we could say the media is almost like a black hole mm it's completely gets sucked in and it's very difficult to actually protect oneself so i used to write for this uh, speaking tree column and then i was i asked the editor and i wrote two three articles we got to know each other a little bit uh, because times of india was the first newspaper in india which started a spiritual column this called speaking tree so i asked the editor how did you start this what inspired you to start this so she replied and said that most of the news newspaper is consisting of three things death destruction and deceit and all these agitate the readers minds so we wanted yeah. at least one corner in our paper which will calm people's mind so that's why we have this spiritual column this is not so much for spiritual wisdom per se but it is more for soothing wisdom which can calm people's mind down so that's with respect to the media actually this could be a big subject but i think we have covered most of it any other thoughts on this no so then that brings us to the last part of spare time it's a, it's interesting that i think it was j maynard smith or someone who said at the start of the 20th century that the, as machines start doing more and more of the work which humans are doing they will start washing vessels wash, washing clothes and transporting us here and there this is the biggest crisis that future humanity will have is that they will have so much time on their hands that they don't know what to do with that time <laughs> now machines are doing a significant amount of our work but we really don't have time so it's uh, we have, we have become busier and uh, the no time disease is a is a big big problem not because it's we are not saying people shouldn't be busy but it is that often people are so busy that we don't even have the time to think whether what we are busy in is worthwhile or is there something more that we need to we need to think about it's like we are so busy run, climbing up a ladder that we don't even have time to think whether that ladder is resting on the right wall or not yeah so i i used to read one uh, i think is a irish uh, management thinker called charles handy so he emphasized on the four f's for uh, an industrial society and he said these are important family friends fun and festivals and he said if these are taken care of then you can have profit performance and productivity the three p's so the four f's depend upon the three p's now again a western phenomenon Sorry, called four f's depend on three p's or are the three yeah, p's should if you have the four f's, f's properly yeah only then you can have people performance and productivity or profits performance and productivity oh if you, okay so in today's to world out the the three, first you yeah, have the three p's but you lost the four fs in many ways exactly minutes. and that's why people are just confused like uh, it is pointed out that having a tan your skin tan meant that you are a you are a farm worker because all day in the sun in the summer or whatever out outdoor work that makes your body tan hmm so what was seen as a sign the symbol of somebody being poor in the 70s and 80s 1980s 1970s that became the sign of opulence that he is so rich or she is so rich that they can afford to have a nice holiday when they can tan themselves so oh okay yeah so spare time seemed to be like a richer a person the more resourceful obviously has to have more spare time and somewhere this spare time instead of becoming a perk instead of becoming a ornament it started becoming like a sign of a disease that laziness yeah laziness or redundancy 
Hmm. How how can I if you say somebody that can I meet you on this particular day? You may say, look, come to my office any time of the week, and any time after three o'clock, I'm always free. Now you may feel surprised that should I actually go to him because he doesn't seem to be a busy person. <laughs> how can he even do the work? <laughs> oh God! So so obviously. What uh, from a psychological point of view or from a psychotherapist point of view, that having some spare time for yourself is not only a necessity to keeping yourself sane, but you can actually perform much better. Like they say, if you have one axe and you have to cut down ten logs, better to spend an hour sharpening your axe. Mm. So you can do the like an hour spent in sharpening. Will save three hours later, but if you say no, no, I can't have spare time, so I need to work. But with the blunt axe, you are actually spending more time on your job. You have anything to add about spare time? How exactly it is a? No, so you are saying that home? spare time would be the time when our axe would get sharpened. Is that spare how you are connecting? Would, yes, yes, yes. Your intellect gets uh, sharpened. You have time to recuperate. You can take a like a bird's eye view or a lion's view. They say Sihaam Lokan. Sihaam Lokan means you walk 20 steps, stop and look back. And Vihanga Lokan means you rise above the particular scenery like a bird and then take a bird's eye view. Yeah. So there are two aspects. It's beautiful. So Sihaam Lokan and And we hang our local, so see how well. So there are two aspects to it. On one side, everybody is busy, and even leisure or holidays become another box to be ticked. And then that box has to be ticked in as prestigious a way as possible. Yeah. So if I go to some expensive spa or expensive hillside resort, then oh, you went for vacations there. That's great. Then you put your uh, photos on Facebook, and people think, oh, you must be so happy. You went to such a wonderful place. But whether somebody is actually happy or not, that's open to question. The problem often comes up that rather than doing the things which nourish our soul. which actually make us feel connected feel satisfied feel feel harmonized with who we are so even our whatever little spare time we have that spare time is lost in doing the things which will earn social approval for us and as it is almost like the more we more so if we want to summarize the evil rainbow of uh, consumerism one aspect one way of looking at it could be that the more we get attracted by this rainbow the further we go from ourselves the further we go from who we are and the things that will make us find real fulfillment so we at one level because of the sheer pressure of the work we don't have as much spare time and even if we have that spare time we don't uh, use that spare time in a way that lacks nourishers use it in a way that is so much uh, more of a social social cosmetic and that that's why we just uh, feel stressed out so in some ways the wisdom of the bhagavad gita if you understand it will be able to ground ourselves firmly in proper self understanding and once we have that proper self understanding then we can see for ourselves what are the things that are important for us and then we can decide that other things are not that important for me i read a fascinating way in which say the idea that we have multiple lives can help us streamline This is funny hmm. when I read it. He said that the author said that that the world has so much to experience, and it keeps glamorizing. Experience this, go here, watch this, read this. So he said that if you feel you have only one lifetime, you know you don't want to miss out on anything. But if you have understanding that you have many lifetimes, 
you focus on the things that are important for you right now if other things are to be experienced you can experience them in a future lifetime so you just postpone yeah. some of the things to a future lifetime and that way uh, to prioritize if we understand that uh, what actually nourishes my soul what harmonizes me with who i am if i focus on doing those things that will make me more contented and that strength that inner intellectual conviction to do that can come from our grounding in spiritual knowledge just one thought came to my mind that uh, like a stroll in the night if it is possible otherwise on a holiday in the morning uh, in a nearby park or at the seashore and taking some hints what what krishna says in the bhagavad gita that i am the light of the sun and the moon so even if we don't know or even if we know that it is day time do we really get time to look at the sun in its majesty whether it is the noon day sun or the setting sun or the rising sun and meditate upon the fact that this is one of krishna's energies or the soothing light of the moon like in the current lockdown situation especially when uh, we were told that we should not crowd in the small temple room so i always stroll in the courtyard and nowadays you can see like it was nursing chaturdashi chapter when it was the full moon so you just really admire the soothing light of the moon and then you feel that this is the same light being reflected from the sun But how come the sun's light is so glaring and this one is so soothing and although they all they are both part of krishna's energies mm. or just take a sip of sip from a glass of water and instead of just gulping it down for a few seconds meditate rasoham apsukaunte here that the taste of this is actually krishna so this is the kind of uh, like that the japanese way of uh, doing big time improvements by very small increments it is called the kaizen approach mm. that you don't immediately go for profitability or whatever you want to achieve you just take very small incremental steps so although we have labor saving devices and we have entertaining devices one thing everybody agrees the modern man today doesn't have much modern man doesn't have so much of a spare time and this is important because we need to <coughs> step back it is there in shrimad bhagavatam i think it is uh, with regard to jadabharat's father that he forgot about death but death did not hmm that's so, true so you may be keeping yourself so busy with uh, work 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 but uh, one part of time like uh, steven kavi had a brilliant idea that how many executives on their deathbed have their last desire that i wish i could spend some more time at my desk mm-hmm. so it is always that i exist for doing things and in order to help me achieve that i also work in an office or in a studio or in a workshop or whatever but right now what has happened is what i normally do is i work and then if there is some time remaining then i have some time for family for fun for festivals for friends for relationships mm. our priorities have got completely distorted Yeah. where often the least uh, important is often the most valued and perhaps entertainment is one example of this that let us spend millions of dollars on making movies entertainment is fine as far as it goes but if we are spending this much money on entertainment that means that which is the most uh, at one level superficial entertainment is not like a need like food or clothing food or air or water but that becomes so valued that indicates that our priorities have become so 
skewed and we think that different ways what we will what will actually fulfill us we are not at all clear about that so i'll summarize or you like to summarize no no you summarize so we discussed about the rainbow of the dark or deceptive rainbow of consumerism and today we started with talking about how people are defined by their work and then that discussed three things last time and we continued on today people are defined by their work your performance in work is defined by you and you alone that's meritocracy and then um, because of this there is constant anxiety and then today we discussed about how within the consumeristic world view love is considered to be extrinsic it is when i have to express my love to others it is through things and that's how festivals are created which are and commercialized like say mothers day or valentines day or whatever else and then also i feel that i have to acquire something external by which i can have some love and whether it is between the romantic relationship or the parent child relationship this creates a tremendous amount of existential insecurity if i think that i am not intrinsically lovable and the spiritual wisdom of the of the bhakti tradition helps us understand that we are all innately parts of god and thus there is a spark of the divine within all of us which makes us all lovable and if we have that vertical relationship then our horizontal relationship with others can be stabilized and pursued with maturity not determined not desperation then it talked about what further fuels the extrinsic nature of the love is the whole idea that the consumer is the king mm. so the parameter of success and prestige in society is how much you are consuming now to consume that much we also have to produce that much but we don't think about that and this idea that we are the consumers leads to people slaving to get lifestyle products and in getting those lifestyle products quite often there is great great anxiety and you talked uh, somewhat related theme of how women japan there is work related suicides and people in trying to get the objects of prestige they become burdened by those and then related with that consumption why this craving for consumption because the media constantly keeps portraying and glamorizing things so the media if we consider there is the news which are all which are most predominantly about provocative things this going wrong there that going wrong there deceit death and destruction and then to get relief from that we watch entertainment but the entertainment is uh, largely centered on people who are who are wealthy and uh, attractive and then that makes us want to look at the commercials and buy the things which we feel will fill the emptiness in our hearts so once we are caught in this three things that we have to get love through externals we have to consume things and we seek uh, believe the media then we get so caught in external that we have no spare time at all and even if we have spare time that is used not so much to nourish our souls as to enhance our social image by going to expensive prestigious places for our so called holidays or breaks and for all this if we ground ourselves in our spiritual identity then it will then we will have as i say we will have our head straight we'll know what our priorities are and then we can choose what to focus on and what to let go and that way we we uh, although consumerism may be there all around us but we won't be consumed by consumerism rather we can carefully choose how much we want to be involved in it any other points i left out Thank you. Thank you. It was thank you. Wonderful discussing.